comes to mind when you reflect on your childhood. I can remember a handful of specific things that happened, like getting really scared at a haunted house at a local carnival when I was a toddler, winning an award for writing a song in fourth grade, and losing my dad during freshman year of high school. I could pull a lot more from my figurative cache, but my memories have been mostly warped over time and I can no longer recall certain events with 100% accuracy, but I do tend to remember emotions and assign nostalgia to things like smell, music, and imagery. I have very vivid memories of this alien-like lava lamp I had when I was young. I liked leaving it on as I fell asleep, watching the purple globs ooze around this toilet blue colored liquid. I know this seems like an odd introspective way to start a television retrospective, but it is all related. The Adventures of Pete and Pete is a show that really captures what it's like to be a kid. It doesn't glorify childhood, it puts it in your face and reminds you of what growing up was like using surreal concepts and abstract ideas, and yet these ideas are not so out there that it makes the show unrelatable. I think it's one of the most well-written shows that came out of Nickelodeon's golden age, and is stuck with people in my generation as being something special. So today I'm going to be discussing why the show stood out, and what you can expect from it if you're a new watcher. And maybe we'll even figure out some of these weird song lyrics from the intro, but probably not. I can't be The Adventures of Pete and Pete was created by Will McRobb and Chris Fiscardi and began as a series of shorts that served as interstitials for Nickelodeon from 1989 to 1991. In fact, some of these shorts are so burned into my mind that I thought some of them were full episodes. I couldn't even begin to tell you how many times I saw the short that featured Big Pete mowing the grass by the street and his friend Ellen walking beside him to keep him company. Because the shorts were so popular, the creators went on to make five 30-minute specials, which then evolved into the show. It ran on Nickelodeon from 1993 to 1996, three seasons worth. It follows the adventures of two gentlemen named Peter, one commonly referred to as Big Pete and the other as Little Pete, and their relationships with their friends and family. The Wrigley family lives in a special town called Wellsville, which is based on a song of the same name by a band named The Embarrassment. It was filmed primarily in New Jersey with a single camera setup and had a fairly low budget, as most of the Nick shows did in the early 90s. The creators had a great love for music and wanted to incorporate that into the show. They asked one of their favorite bands, Miracle Legion, to compose the music for Pete and Pete. The lead singer, Mark Mulcahy, accepted the offer and wrote Hey Sandy under the band name Polaris. It became the show's theme song and the band members also show up in the intro sequence for every episode. Hey The creators also went on to say that the song The Backyard by Miracle Legion was a huge inspiration for the tone of the show, and if you listen to it after watching a few episodes, you can definitely hear its influence. At one point, they wanted to license from the Pixies, but after finding out it would cost them $80,000 for one song, they noped out of that pretty quickly. The introduction only took three to four hours to film. Director Michael Spinner recalls, I didn't give Mark or the rest of the band much direction. They just played the song a bunch of times. Have fun, have high energy. The theme song is pretty notorious for its garbled singing. Originally, the lyrics to the song were a mystery, but over the years, people have pieced together the majority of them. The third line specifically is still up for debate, and so is the meaning of the song. Also, I just want to add that this song fucking rocks. I love it. The solo kicks ass, and it's so disconnected from the show in terms of meaning and sound, but in a way, that's what makes it fit so perfectly. I would be genuinely upset if I had tuned into an episode of Pete and Pete and missed the intro because I couldn't wait to hear this song as a kid. Polaris contributed a number of songs to the show and essentially became its in-house band. Their song, She's Staggering, can often be heard in some of the episode's credits, which is also an amazing song! Just like Hey Sandy, it's not really about the show in any way, but it has this romantic, wistful sound that holds hands with the tone of the show. If it's not clear, I really like this band, so go seek out their music, you will not be disappointed. The surreal nature of the show varies in intensity. Sometimes you'll have scenarios that are over the top and inexplicable, and other times you'll get a story that seems completely grounded in reality. I think because the show does have a lot of emotion behind it, the bizarre sections didn't seem as out there as they could have been. I mean, sure, there's an episode dedicated to a bowling ball that seems to have ominous superpowers, but we've all been there, right? Something really cool about this show was that it didn't use any sets. Everything was filmed around parts of New Jersey. If they needed any footage of Pete in school, they would film at Bayonne High School, and the houses were also real. The creators prided themselves on the fact that the show felt so gritty. They never minded if outside noise made it into the scenes. 
Another notable thing about Pete and Pete is its crazy impressive list of guest stars, many of whom did not quite fit the category of family friendly. This list is massive, but some of my personal favorites were the musicians because music was and is such an important thing in my life. I was most amused to see Iggy Pop, who played the father of one of Little Pete's friends. Mostly I was just surprised that he agreed to wear clothing. Apparently Iggy liked working on the show so much that he offered to stick around the set and do more scenes if anyone wanted him to. We're gonna stop you, sicko. Sadly, the show was canceled after just three seasons after its popularity started to dwindle. DVD sets for seasons one and two were released in 2005, season three was in the works, and the creators have stated that the DVDs are actually all ready to go, sitting in a warehouse somewhere. Unfortunately, after the DreamWorks and Paramount Pictures merger, all plans to release the third season were squashed. Indefinitely. I cannot tell you how sad it makes me to know that we may never get this release to the public because the special guests really ramped up during that time. Someone quit sitting on this gold mine and released the damn thing already. One last thing I'd like to mention before getting right into the episodes and what the show entails is that the costuming was done by Janie Bryant, who had a penchant for vintage pieces. She found that the combination of retro and modern clothing worked well for the quirkiness of the characters and the town of Wellsville itself, and many people jokingly claim that the show was responsible for the rise of hipster fashion. Bryant also once said, It almost has a Wes Anderson aesthetic to it. Maybe Wes Anderson was inspired by Pete and Pete. She went on to do costume design for Mad Men and most recently for the 2017 version of It. Unrelated, but Joan Holloway is a goddess. A goddess! Right, let's now take a closer look at the show and the sum of its parts. I find it somewhat difficult to explain how The Adventures of Pete and Pete works in terms of formula because I feel that so many of the episodes are about getting across a certain emotion versus telling a story across the three seasons. Like a lot of Nickelodeon sitcoms in the early 90s, the episodes had their own contained stories, but after rewatching many of them for this video, I realized that I had not retained what they were about specifically. When I think about this show, I think about summer breaks, elementary school, the weird adults around me growing up, and the chaos of being a kid. The shenanigans and Pete and Pete are far different from something like Hey Dude or Salute Your Shorts. Those were just weird situations and conflicts that only happened because nobody knew how to communicate properly. They were exaggerated young people's problems, like having a crush on someone who didn't reciprocate, or, you know, eating sushi for the first time. Shit like that. The creator's philosophy was to create something that was equal parts funny, sad, strange, and beautiful. And I think they achieved this in spades. The show was originally going to be about a boy and his dog, but the creator said they just couldn't find the perfect dog. Sounds like a solid idea, but I must say I like the brother relationship dynamic a bit more. I just want to say that this might actually be the shittiest thing I've ever drawn. The main characters are Pete, Pete's little brother Pete, his parents, Ellen, who is a girl and a friend, but not Big Pete's girlfriend, and Artie, the strongest man in the world. The show is narrated by Big Pete, and the episodes are usually about some strange incident from his recent past that he is recalling. He usually has the more grounded conflicts of the show, whereas Little Pete usually has the more ridiculous issues. He also has a tattoo on his arm named Petunia. Tight. Artie serves as the goofiest character and as the kid's personal superhero. Kind of strange to have a grown man gallivanting around spouting random oddball phrases, but I always thought he was an important ingredient in Pete and Pete. He provides the funny in the funny, sad, strange, and beautiful equation. And also the strange. 19 o'clock, and all left is pipe. It was hard to choose which episodes to showcase because I think most of them are really good. There were very few clunkers, so I decided to discuss the ones I think most exemplify Pete and Pete as a whole. The first one I'll be discussing is from one of the original five specials, and it's one of my personal favorites, what we did on our summer vacation. Big Pete tells the story about how he, Little Pete, and Ellen try to befriend Mr. Tasty, an ice cream man who never takes off his costume. This is also Artie's first appearance in a 30-minute episode. He doesn't have a big role in this one, but... He does fight a bee. Ah, oh, blink! Blink, I say, you stinky bee! At one point, the kids of the town get curious about who Mr. Tasty really is. Ellen, who is working a job at a photo development booth, finds a set of photos labeled with his name, and after some encouragement from the Peets, they decide to open it. Open it before somebody comes. They can't. Come on. It's totally against the rules. Rules bite! Also, I just want to quickly point out that I love Little Pete's insults and enthused comebacks. Eat my turf, crow dog! Suck chatter, muscle head! Good morning, gut buckets! Nickelodeon wasn't jazzed about using phrases like shut up, but this was okay, I guess. 
What do you want, you fiber-licking blowhole? Just the right amount of risky that could get past the sensors. Though there were instances of parents calling in to express concern over a few of them, they also probably weren't thrilled about lemon licky nubs. The kids find photos of Tasty in various places and realize he never takes off his costume and is never pictured with anyone else, leading them to believe that he must be lonely. These photos are real, by the way. Toby Huss, who played Tasty, really did have to pose with this giant swirly head on his noggin, pretending to hold a pretzel. They make a few attempts to pry into his life, insisting that they could all be friends, but Tasty, who seems to be having intimacy issues, flees at the first sign of any kind of human affection. After that, the kids spend their summer dying of heat and trying to track down the missing ice cream Cream Man. This episode is fantastic for a number of reasons. The cameos are some of my favorites. Catherine Diekman, who directed this episode, had previously directed the music video for R.E.M.'s Shiny Happy People, so through that connection she was able to recruit Michael Stipe, who is perfectly awkward as this second-rate ice cream man, Mr. Scrummy. You'll have to talk to Mr. Tasty if it's a blue tornado you're after. And Kate Pearson. She plays an aloof neighbor who goes around sighing about some guy named Leonard. Leonard said my eyes were bluer than the bluest blue tornado bar. In the commentary included with the DVDs, the creator said that their personal backstory for her is that she secretly wanted to have children with Mr. Tasty, but due to his intimacy issues, he couldn't and took up life as a plastic ice cream swirl. Michael Stipe was especially nervous when they shot his scenes, and due to this, we get the most amazing eyebrow wiggle I've ever witnessed. Like I said, you look like a bona fide sludge sickle man. Those things are moving at the goddamn speed of light. This was also Heather Matarazzo's acting debut. She's been in many movies, but in my heart, she will always be Lily from The Princess Diaries. In a surreal moment, Pete's dad, who had been walking around the beach with a metal detector, finds a car in the sand, specifically a Cutlass Supreme. Why? No idea, but it's great, and things like this happen throughout the duration of the show. And speaking of metal, another recurring theme is Mom's metal plate, which sometimes causes her to have weird reactions to radio frequencies and other high-pitched sounds. The decision to give her a metal plate was based on real-life baseball player Don Zimmer, who was rumored to have a metal plate put in his head after getting beamed several times with a baseball. It did turn out to be untrue, just in case you were wondering. Mr. Tasty does come back to confront the children and to pick up his vacation photos, and the kids have one last visit with him. Kind of a melancholy ending, but it perfectly summarizes the ups and downs of summer and its eventual end when things have to go back to normal. It's strangely endearing for a story about a weird dude who sells chocolate thunder chunks. Another episode I would like to showcase is called Day of the Dot, the second episode of season one. Joseph Stillman wrote this episode, who also worked on Beavis and Butthead Do America, Shrek 1 and 2, and King of the Hill. I feel like I've seen this episode more than others. I'm not sure if it's because I favored it or because it reran a lot on Nickelodeon, but regardless, it does deserve to be remembered. A big theme for this episode seems to be geek power. It follows the marching band for Pete's school as they learn their new formation, and according to my nerdy friends, this is a grossly accurate depiction of high school marching band. On top of this specific brand of nerdy, the episode also includes science, romance, and typography jokes. Even more radical was his daring decision to change our typeface from the traditional Helvetica to Roman Gothic. Can he do that? Ellen has been assigned the dot over the I in the word squid and becomes obsessed with it. I am a dot. I am a dot. I am a dot. I am a dot. When Big Pete sees Ellen has been toiling over her marching band duties, he starts to examine his feelings for her, and also becomes jealous when she starts showing affection to some chowderhead named James Jr. We also get to see more of Big Pete's friends in this episode, introduce our two new characters named Bill and Teddy. Wait, Bill and Teddy, are you serious? All we are is dust in the wind, dude. The subplot for this episode is about a heartbroken bus driver named Stu Benedict, who can't stop lamenting about his ex-girlfriend, Sally Knorp. Coming up next, the, the hardware store where we used to buy our weather stripping. The kids on the bus are now on this somber ride from hell because he refuses to stop driving and talking about every little thing that reminds him of Sally. Watching this episode as a kid was relatable, while watching it as an adult makes me reflect on the things I felt as a kid. The complicated emotions you start to develop for someone you thought was just a friend, obsessing with something mundane, dealing with your weirdo friends and your nerdy interests, and riding the fucking bus. 
There are several episodes that showcase the relationship between Big Pete and Ellen, and I really like how the show handled it. It feels more natural than what you'd see on, say, a saccharine Disney show, or even other Nick shows, honestly. These characters do not have a cliché love-hate relationship, nor does it ever fully develop. They have sentimental moments, but remain close friends for the duration of the series. And because it's not a main focus, the times where Pete and Ellen do have a romantic segment feel more special. Happy Valentine's Day, Ellen. Thanks, Pete. Beautiful. Well, I guess we don't have our big secret anymore. There'll be other secrets, Pete. I just know there will. Speaking of relatable, it would be remiss of me to not mention the very first official episode titled King of the Road. This is a very simple premise about the family going on a road trip to the Hoover Dam, and though there seem to be many road trip episodes in every sitcom, I found this one especially engaging. There are just so many simple truths in it. Pete and Pete was brilliant at taking the woes of a high schooler and adding this crazy amount of drama and turmoil to them, but it always ends on a heartwarming note. Even when there's a particularly sad conclusion, I always feel moved in a mostly positive way. The saddest thing that happened during the series as a whole, for multiple reasons, was when Artie left Wellsville. In the two-part episode, Farewell My Little Viking, people start to get concerned over Artie's presence for reasons they can't really explain. I hate canoes. He is especially disliked by John McFlump, an aluminum siding salesman who doesn't really understand Artie's unorthodox way of living. Instead of letting it go for the non-issue it is, he clings to any reason he can find to dislike him, even if the reasons are innocuous, driving home the I hate what I don't understand notion. You think it's a good idea for your son to be hanging around a lunatic like that Artie character? The adults start a conspiracy bolstered by McFlump and rope Don Wrigley, Pete's dad, into helping them rid the town of Artie. Don feels bad that he can't be his son's superhero and attempts some father-son time, and soon after, little Pete feels bad that he can't be his own superhero. After getting in a confrontation with a bully named Papercut, he regrets not standing up for himself. You're a real butt kicker, all right. But I guess it's easy to be brave when you don't have to fight your own battles. This drives Don to tell Artie that Pete no longer needs him and pressures him to stay away from the town. It's all really sad. Every dejected expression on Artie's face when the parents slight him or call him a freak sends my heart right into my stomach. In an extra gut-wrenching scene, Don tells Artie that it was Pete's idea to banish him from Wellsville. He didn't have the heart to tell you himself. That's why he asked me. He wants you to go. In part two, Papercut attempts to seek his revenge on Little Pete, but his friends work together to stave him off. Heartbroken at Artie's absence, the family uses various bizarre methods to lure him back, but Don, under the pressure of McFlemp and his League of Awful parents, keeps sabotaging their efforts. McFlemp takes it even further by hiring Artie with the intention of turning him into a normal person that can blend in with society. You too will enjoy the feeling of the pleasure ridges. Pleasure ridges, huh? Yeah. I like those too. Don finally snaps out of it and searches for Artie, only to find he's been brainwashed by McFlump. Fortunately, the mention of Pete jogs his memory back to life and he barrels back home, just in time to see Pete and his friends take down Paper Cut together. Seeing that Pete can take care of himself, Artie decides he's passed on everything he could and leaves to find another child who needs a superhero. He does not return for season three, and Michelle Trachtenberg, who you may remember as Harriet the Spy, takes his place in the intro sequence as Nona, little Pete's friend and sometimes love interest. The parents play a slightly larger role in the third season as well, which is fine. I always thought mom and dad were very odd parents. Odd parents, very odd parents. Which consequently made them more realistic and relatable to me. This episode is exactly why it's okay to dive into more complex emotions and ideas in children's entertainment. It's refreshing to see these characters flesh out their feelings and encourage people to be their own little Vikings in life. And I especially appreciated seeing Don navigate through his issues with his son. Even though this still ended with Artie leaving, it's still really touching, though I do feel that the show was never quite the same after his exit. Season 3 really amped up the surreal humor, but I always felt like it was missing that component that made childhood so innocent and fun. Artie was the blue cheese on the steak for me. You don't necessarily need it, but it makes everything so much more indulgent. I'm not exactly sure why Huss left the show. It could be because he had gotten other roles of higher priority, but I do think it was a good move regardless. I did like the friendship between Artie and Little Pete, but at the same time, these kids are maturing and getting older with each episode, so it was smart to have him depart. But it did feel like Calvin just lost Hobbs. The creators mentioned that some people thought Artie could have been imaginary and that only Little Pete could see him, but there's really no evidence to support that, especially in these final episodes of season two. 
When I was a youngin, I don't recall viewing Artie as an adult. He did have a certain fantastical quality to him, as he was meant to be a superhero. As an adult, he reads like a symbol for childhood imagination and whimsy. Fun fact, the character was not originally a part of this show, and the creators were not responsible for writing him. It came straight from the mind of Toby Huss himself. He got the idea for Artie when somebody gave him a red pair of long underwear, and to make his girlfriend at the time laugh, he would pull them up over his chest, flex, and say that he was the strongest man in the world. And actually, this is the perfect segue into the next section of this video. Mike Morona played Big Pete, and you may recognize him right away as Jeff McAllister in Home Alone 1 and 2. Beyond that, his acting roles have been minor, showing up here and there in movies and television shows. In the late 90s, he played an oddball character named Stewart for Ameritrade commercials. Morona brought back this character for a short film called President Clinton, The Final Days, which was shown at the 2000 White House Correspondents Association dinner. He also, at some point, grew out his hair and rocked braided ponytails. I cannot explain this, but felt it was important to add. Danny Tamborelli played Little Pete. His first major television role was playing Sean Novak on the soap opera Ryan's Hope. He also played Jackie Rodowski on the Babysitter's Club television series, but his larger roles really began after The Adventures of Pete and Pete took off. He played the voice of Arnold in The Magic School Bus, had a small role in The Mighty Ducks, was a cast member on Nickelodeon's SNL for Young People, all that, and in 2013 he voiced Jimmy DeSanta in Grand Theft Auto V. He was clearly the visual inspiration as well, and now I find it a little weird that Pete is in a Grand Theft Auto game. Buffo! He's also a musician, playing the bass guitar and singing lead vocals for the band Jounce. Alison Finelli played Ellen Hickel, and she didn't really pursue acting outside of Pete and Pete. She did do a little voice acting for her brother, Chris Neosi, otherwise known as Kerbifer, on the internet, and then went on to become a doctor. Badass. She recently did a short interview for her brother's podcast where she reflects on her time with the show. I will put that in the description for your listening pleasure. Toby Huss played Artie, and excuse me, but these are the same people? Really? Really? This is blowing my mind right now. For some reason, I never knew that the actor who played John Bosworth on Halt and Catch Fire was also this eccentric character on Pete and Pete. Toby Huss's list of credits is actually massive. He's been everywhere over the years. Movies, television, voice acting, the man is very prolific. Some of his more notable roles are Khan and Cotton Hill on King of the Hill, and Felix Stumpy Dreyfus on Carnival. Huss was apparently very zany and funny on the set of Pete and Pete. Alison Finelli recalls having to redo this take of one of the original shorts because she couldn't stop laughing at him. I should also mention that everyone got along really well on set and there wasn't any drama that I'm aware of. The cast did a reunion panel in 2012 at the Orpheum in Los Angeles, then another in 2015 at Kamikaze Con. The Adventures of Pete and Pete is exactly what the creators said it would be. Funny, sad, strange, and beautiful. It's a bit of a cult classic within the children's television genre. If you can find the DVDs, I do recommend buying them, even at a higher price point, because this show is very much worth watching, even if you're completely new to the series. It's a show I liked growing up, but after going through all of the episodes for this video, I realized that it can be even more poignant and creatively fulfilling for an adult. I also realized that this show is important to me, more than I even thought. I think director Catherine Diekman put it best when summarizing the show. From the beginning, Pete and Pete was all about this melancholy and emotionality of childhood as much as it was absurdist. We sort of took that approach to talking about childhood, which was not sentimental and not corny and obvious. It was more about the strange things that happen in childhood and how truthful those are. I want to thank you all for joining me on this look back at the adventures of Pete and Pete. If you want to show some support, please consider lightly booping the like button, or if you're feeling chatty, drop me a comment about your favorite episodes of Pete and Pete. The current YouTube algorithm is strange and confusing, so any form of support is greatly appreciated. If you want to support the show in a way that entails giving me money so I can buy life essentials, consider becoming a patron, or if you want to follow my mundane life updates or desperately need to know the status of my bird, the links to my social media pages are in the description. Thanks again, and as always, I'll see you in the next one.